All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen. Welcome to our information, intermediation, and instruction Q&A with our lovely advisors. This is part of our pathway series introducing the different MLIS career pathways, where you will get an inside perspective from instructors and guests who have worked in specific fields. Today, we'll be talking about skill sets that prepare students for work in reference, instructional design, and related information settings. So let's get started with our agenda. Today's agenda consists of finding out what is information intermediation and instruction pathway, which courses students should consider, how do students use the skill set and in information work, and then we'll meet faculty and staff with expertise in this area who have made themselves available to answer your advising questions. So what is information intermediation and instruction? Well, it is about understanding how to help users define and articulate their information needs by using skills such as communication, retrieval techniques, evaluating sources and services, effective leadership and management skills, and instructing users. You might wanna focus on designing tools to enhance clients' information literacy skills. Here's a list of core knowledge that students pursuing the pathway should be building for a career in this area, such as research methodologies and evolution of information services and the core values held by information service providers. These can be found on the iSchool MLIS career pathway for information intermediation and instruction. Additional information on standards for these skills is available on the Association of College and Research Libraries and Reference and User Services Association websites. Please take a look at what is in the yellow. Foundational and recommended courses such as Info 282 with the topic on change management and Info 220 with the topic on psychology of the information user, data librarianship, can be found on our MLIS website under this pathway. If you're interested in this pathway along with other pathways, there is a great tool on our iSchool Advising Toolkit website that allows you to see which courses different pathways have in common. This tool is called MLIS Career Pathways Compare Courses in Common. And here is Sheila. Great. So, uh, we're going to talk about information intermediation and instruction jobs that cross a variety of library and non-library environments. And I really uh, highly recommend that everyone download our MLIS Skills at Work report, which is actually available from the uh, homepage of our website. It was just released not too long ago. And there are many tips about the information intermediation and instruction job landscape, which could be found inside this report. Um, and some of the career environments are listed on the slide here, um, where you would find specific information about working with information intermediation and instruction in those different types of environments. Now, many of the most in-demand skills in library and information science are part of the information intermediation and instruction skill set, both the soft skills and the library and information science skills. So inside the report on pages 11 and 12, you will see that many of the most in-demand skills are, are from this pathway, including soft skills such as communication, collaboration, interpersonal and organization skills, but also LIS skills such as technology, training, research, customer service. And here are just a few job titles that you will find uh, that relate to this skill set, including, of course, reference librarianship in many types of different libraries, um, student success and outreach librarians in the academic library, library instructors, database trainers, data services librarians, and information brokers. And then on the right hand side of the slide are some applied skills 
from job descriptions that I had pulled out. For example, um, this one was asking for um, someone to train law students and others in the use of legal materials and databases through extensive classroom teaching, leading of tours, and one-on-one -on -one instruction. Um, another a job was asking for uh, someone to do research analysis of user needs, preferences, objectives, and working methods, and how users consume content, including data categorization and labeling. Another uh, was seeking out uh, to seek out and develop opportunities to offer instruction and scholarship support with digital fabrication and multimedia services. So I highly recommend taking a look at our uh, MLIS Skills at Work report for very specific ideas about uh, what you would be doing in these different positions. Um, on this next slide, I retrieved an example of a corporate instructional uh, design position description, uh, which had an annual salary of 89,000. And I wanted to point out that there are some highlighted skills that really dovetail well with some of the LIS skill areas that you can be building in our program if you're following the information intermediation and instruction pathway. So I highlighted some um, that I saw here, advanced knowledge of instructional design and digital learning tools. Um, they were looking for someone comfortable in a fast-paced environment with multiple deadlines and shifting priorities. Sounds like iSchool. Um, they were looking for specific skills I called out here. Um, they were looking for someone who, who knew Evolve, Articulate, Captivate, PowerPoint, Adobe CS, and Camtasia Studio. Um, they were looking for somebody who could develop learning concepts through audio, video, role plays, games, um, so there are a lot of um, skills here that we can see come, can come directly from the information intermediation and instruction courses at iSchool. Um, you can also create job alerts on uh, resources such as indeed.com or other job search aggregators with keywords so that you can begin to see what types of positions, even in non-library settings, might be available in your area. Now, these are just a few that came up in the San Francisco Bay Area when I searched for positions with the information, intermediation, and instruction skill set. So you can see um, there was a senior trainer position for customer success. There was a PeopleSoft trainer curriculum developer uh, for a consulting company, PeopleSoft is a database, you know, that we use at San Jose State. There was an instructional designer position that was a remote position, um, an engagement project delivery manager in, within higher education for Workday. There was a product trainer and evangelist um, support position. And there was a curriculum design and training manager, um, which was also a remote position. And finally, I wanted to point out that LinkedIn is, can also be another great source of information when you're trying to analyze what um, could be available using these library and information science um, skill set from information intermediation and instruction. So if you want to see where other iSchool alumni are working in this pathway, um, you can do some searching through LinkedIn. Here's one example. Greta Snyder, who, who wrote for the iSchool career blog and was involved with iSchool Student Research Journal, found a position as an e-learning specialist in the private sector after she completed her MLIS here. So instead of working in an academic library, she's putting her skills to use, working for a company that's an assistive technology provider for the visually impaired. And you can take a look at her profile and some of the skills that she's called out in her LinkedIn profile for this position. And they really do match up with the information skills um, that are learned following this pathway. So it's a real treat now for us to um, open up the floor. You're gonna have an opportunity to hear from three speakers on our panel. They're all experts in this pathway within library and information science. 
Um, we have th uh, two of our faculty advisors and our own director of online learning. And first, they are going to introduce themselves and let you know a bit more about their background and the, um, their background and their journey through this pathway and the skills that they feel are important, as well as some a little bit about the courses that they teach. And then at the end, we'll be opening it up to Q&A for any of your questions. So first off is Dr. Aguinaga. Hello there, everyone. Jose Aguinaga. Um, I joined the iSchool back in spring of 2020. And since that time, as you might imagine, it's been an interesting uh, teaching and learning experience for everyone involved. I'm teaching uh, Info uh, 210, Reference and Information Services. But before I got to San Jose State as a lecturer, let me uh, give you a little background as to how I got here. I began my career, hard to believe, uh, back in 1994 at the University of Houston as a social sciences reference librarian. During that time at Houston, wonderful place to work in and it's a great city. Um, I learned many things. Um, I also was uh, prompted to uh, assume the interim role of human resources coordinator for the library. So uh, talk about a, a learning opportunity and an experience to uh, really pick up on many new skills, the soft skills that were just mentioned that were um, needed at many times. After Houston, I transitioned to my alma mater at University of San Diego. And I was once again back in the library, but this time as a reference librarian, but overseeing at that time, the CD-ROM collection for online databases, as you might imagine. And we transitioned from CD-ROM format to the World Wide Web. That also taught me many skills, more specifically dealing with vendors and how to get the, uh, the best option for, for the university and the students. After that period, I transitioned back to Arizona and I was at Arizona State University West Campus, once again, in the role of social sciences reference librarian, but also involved with web usability, uh, database oversight, and other interesting projects within the ASU community, Arizona State community. And then guess what? I transitioned back to California, this time to California State University, Long Beach. And I was there for uh, about a four year period. And what I did there was once again, social sciences reference librarians specifying in education, criminal justice and social work. Um, those experiences were quite valuable, but the interesting part about being at Cal State Long Beach, the, my last year there, I participated in a program and I was chosen to be a faculty um, advisor, but in the resident halls. So I lived in the dormitories with my wife. And as you might imagine, that really opened my mind and my, my knowledge base regarding students that live on campus and how to provide library services to students on campus. That was a valuable experience. I also became the union rep for the library. That also taught me some interesting aspects about the shared governance process if you're gonna pursue an academic career. So having said all of that, while I was at Cal State Long Beach, I decided to pursue a second master's. And that was in public administration. I completed my studies, but I was so intrigued by the, the content of public administration that I decided I'm gonna apply for a doctoral program I applied for various universities and I was uh, accepted at Arizona State University. So that meant my wife and I would be transitioning back to Arizona and we did that. Uh, I joined Glendale Community College in order to sustain the, uh, a lifestyle and uh, pay the bills. Um, by joining Glendale Community College, that opened a new avenue for me. And for the past 16 years, I've been with community colleges. Majority of that time has, with, has been with Glendale as a reference librarian, but also participated in many aspects within the shared governance process of Glendale Community College in Arizona. I became a faculty senator, and after serving two, three terms as senator, I was uh, prompted to run for faculty senate president. I was the first librarian to be 
running for faculty senate president and to be elected, that in itself opened a new avenue to understanding the administrative side and the faculty side of many issues. That was a quite valuable experience. Besides um, being a reference librarian, I also, I, in my entire career, I've provided instruction. Instruction is a key asset and a valuable skill to have to uh, share that knowledge with students, with faculty, even with visitors that just come in and they wanna use the library. My current position with Glendale, I'm at the North Campus. I've been at the North Campus, which is about 10 miles uh, away from the main campus. And we have a separate library there. I oversee that library and work with the um, information technology staff regarding that facility and also the services that we provide to students at the North Campus. And that's sort of the, the quick summary of my career path. But just to add a few other elements, I've also been involved with the American Library Association on various committees. I served on ALA Council for a three-year period. I'm also heavily involved with ACRL, the Association of College and Research Libraries. I've been on various committees, various task forces, and that keeps me engaged in giving back to my profession and to your profession in the near future if you choose the academic path. So I would encourage your participation and getting involved, whether it's at the local level, state level, or national level. Last but not least, the skills, once again, the soft skills, they make a big difference in developing those relationships with your new partners that you're gonna have, whether in the public library setting, academic setting, or even a special library setting. And last but not least, my wife, who I met in library school, Yes, she's also a librarian, but here's talk about a pathway. She began as a children's librarian. She did that for about 15 years. And the last 15 years, she's been a medical librarian. Talk about a transition. Having those soft skills, having the, the reference skills, the technology skills can assist you in whichever path you wanna pursue. So we, we live an interesting life in two different worlds, academic and medical. So that's just a little bit about me. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Before we move to our next speaker, I just wanted to ask, um, did you have any little tidbits you wanted to share about your class, your Info 210 class, maybe some of the projects or activities that um, students who would be interested in taking Info 210 might be doing in your class, Dr. Aguinaga? Yes, Sheila, thank you for the reminder. That is, that is important. Info 210, just to give you the, the rundown, it's an overview of the type of reference services that are available, whether you're, you wanna, you're interested in the academic path, uh, school librarian path, public librarian path, and even special library path. There are various assignments. Um, the big project, the project assignment, that's what we call it, gives you the opportunity to choose a project, not just the standard I'm gonna submit a 10 page paper, 20 page paper. No, you have that option, but you can also participate. If you're interested in incarcerated librarianship, we have a great relationship with San Francisco Public Library and they have a program for eight weeks. You could be part of that and that can become your project assignment in that you will be answering actual reference questions from the incarcerated population in San Francisco. They will guide you through the process, but you will see interaction just all through a communication written process. But that's one, one of the projects. You can also do a video. You can do a podcast. You can do instructional videos on various tools that as a future librarian, you would be teaching others. So that's, there are many pathways as to what your big project can be. Throughout the 16 weeks, if you take it in the fall or spring, currently I'm teaching it in the summer, which is a condensed version in 10 weeks. We will also have discussions, weekly discussion. There'll be a weekly discussion question. There will be opportunities to do some search activities, which consists of various examples of type of questions that you'll be asked to resolve. And these questions mostly will be relying on online resources. So it's a, it's a quick overview, but it gives you a good feeling if reference will be the pathway you want to pursue and in which, which road you want to follow on, academic, public, school, 
or it's special. And if you have other questions regarding the course, feel free to ask whether now or um, later on, you will have my contact information. I'd be more than happy to provide more insights. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful overview. And now we're going to pass over um, the mic to Dr. Loa. So she's here to talk to you about her uh, specialty area and, and, and especially information about Info 285. All right. Thank you, Sheila. Hi, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. And thank you for the opportunity to um, be here and to talk to you about my experience with information intermediation and instruction as well as research methods. Uh, I, I'm currently a full professor uh, at the iSchool and I joined iSchool in 2007. So it's been 14 years already. And when I first started, I primarily taught Info 210 and reference and information services and research methods. But in the past few years, my focus has shifted exclusively to research methods. Still, reference and information services remains a big part in my heart. And professionally, right now, I serve as the chair of the program advisory committee at our school for the information intermediation and instruction career pathway. And Jose is a, very, is a member of the committee and the committee consists of experts uh, inside and outside of our school in areas related to information intermediation and instruction. We need uh, once every semester to look at uh, the course offerings for the pathway, to look at uh, potential job opportunities for the pathway. And then the uh, committee members would get together and share their observations regarding the trends in the pathway and make suggestions to refine the information on the career pathway page to make sure that everything is up to date um, on the pathway to reflect what's going on currently in the professional practice. So because of that, even though I don't teach 210 anymore, I still get to stay connected with all the experts and, and practitioners in uh, information intermediation and instruction related field. Um, in the meantime, I am a, an instructor for uh, the Institute for Research Design in Librarianship, which is a federally funded program that offers a professional development on research methods for academic and uh, research librarians. Um, every year we have uh, a group of uh, academic and research librarians participating in the program, going through the training to improve their uh, skills in conducting research and in disseminating their research findings. And a lot of those librarians, as you can imagine, they come from uh, information uh, intermediation and instruction related uh, areas such as uh, reference librarians, uh, subject librarians, liaison librarians, you know, the job titles that Sheila um, showed you earlier. And so it's wonderful just to um, stay connected with the um, professionals, to observe them, to ch and chat with them, to learn from them about um, their um, practice and the skill sets um, that are important um, for them to complete their job responsibilities. And I, ha I have to say, the things that highlighted in Sheila's slides and absolutely echo what I, I have observed uh, in the field when I um, um, interact with um, professionals in information and information communication and instruction related um, areas. And I do notice that research skills, research knowledge, the capability to conduct research, to understand user needs, to understand um, an instruction to understand the uh, um, how to better design education programs to to train and to deliver training to use research as a way to generate ideas for those and that's a key skill and highlighted in the um, the skill sets for um, students in or for people pursuing this career pathway it's really not surprising to see that and it's also comforting to see that because I teach research methods I I am the course coordinator for our required research methods course, Info 285, Applied Research Methods. Currently, I teach, um, personally, I teach three uh, uh, topics in this curriculum. And 
as you probably have already noticed at our school, Info 285, the Applied Research Methods curriculum is set up a little different from a lot of other um, library programs because they tend to offer just one general introduction course on research methods. But here at our school, we offer a wide variety of research methods related topics in this curriculum. Some of the topics focus on a particular type of research. For instance, I myself teach a, a course uh, exclu exclusively focusing on just the survey research method, and then an, another new course focusing on unobtrusive research. I just started that this summer. And some other topics focus on a particular type of uh, uh, library and information and practice um, where research and research methods and are, can be applied. For instance, I teach one course focusing on academic librarianship, how academic librarians use research methods to conduct original research and to disseminate their research findings to improve practice. And we have colleagues that for, uh, teach uh, um, courses focusing on youth librarianship to look at research methods youth librarians may apply in their um, particular professional settings. So we do have a wide variety of offerings when it comes to the applied research and methods and Info 285 course. I'd like to share with you the top topics page for Info 285 and to walk you through the offerings and focus on the, the courses, the Info 285 sections that you might find useful um, if you are interested in pursuing um, the career pathway on information intermediation and instruction. So let me share with you the, uh, the screen. So uh, this is the page on the course website. Um, I mean, on the school website that demonstrates the, um, the, the different topics for Info 285. And we do have a general overview course focusing on general introduction of the research methods. And this is really good for people who um, are still a little vague in terms of what they want to pursue. So they can just pick a general um, overview um, section of the research methods um, curriculum. And then for those who are interested in becoming youth librarians, we have one focusing on youth, youth services. So this one about evaluating programs and services, I would definitely recommend this one um, to students are, that are interested in information intermediation and uh, instruction because program evaluation and service evaluation is and can be a big part of um, um, the job responsibilities relate, uh, in related domains. And I did notice that program evaluation, being able to evaluate programs and services is one of the skills in, in highlighted in Sheila's slides. So this can be a good choice. And the, the one that I teach myself researching academic collaboration and as you probably have already noticed, information in intermediation and instruction, um, a lot of the um, job opportunities um, do reside in academic libra libraries, um, you know, liaison librarians, subject librarians, and information uh, and literacy coordinators. These are all jo job titles uh, related to the career pathway that are in academic li libraries. So if you're interested, you can also choose this particular section focusing on research in academic, academic librarianship. And then action research is a good choice as well because action research ultimately helps you produce actual actions based on the research. And this can be very um, practical no matter which career pathway you're interested in. You will be learning very valuable methods in conducting research and uh, producing actions based on the research. And doing research online, um, especially for those of you who are um, interested in engaging in primarily like e-learning or remote work, then this could be a good option. And historical research in writing, and this one and this other one about records management and archival science, these two uh, topics could be good for those of you um, who might want to work in um, archives or special collections. And then I teach one that focuses on survey research because survey is one of the most frequently used 
and research methods adopted by um, libraries, librarians when they're conducting research. Um, this is a, mm, this can be applicable for for pretty much um, all the potential pathways because survey um, is so frequently used. Uh, we also have a couple of new sections. Um, Jason started teaching a 285 um, course focusing on technology management um, two years ago and um, looking at how research methods can be applied in looking in examining technology related to topics. And the one that I just started teaching um, this summer is about unobtrusive research methods, how we could use uh, research methods to uh, look at existing content and data without having to impose ourselves as researchers on human subjects for data collection. For instance, we can uh, look at um, like Facebook postings, tweets, and, and other types of existing content to engage in a rigorous analysis to look at the trends and patterns uh, or conduct statistical analysis of existing data. So we can just access and identify existing data and content for analysis. We don't have to worry about gathering the data using focus group interviews or um, survey questionnaires. And that's why it's called uh, unobtrusive research methods. So, um, so that's a very quick overview of the various types of uh, um, possibilities for you when it comes to choosing the uh, 285 uh, section that could help you uh, with your interest in the uh, information intermediation and the instruction um, pathway. I'm gonna stop sharing now. And just so you know, I'm the course coordinator for 285. So I and do know the curriculum very well. If you have any questions regarding picking the two, uh, 285 section and that's right for you, please don't hesitate to reach out to me um, and ask any questions. Okay, that's, that's it from me. I, I want to say thank you so much for taking, um, for walking us through that um, explanation of Info 285. That's very valuable. So thank you very much. And then uh, I get to introduce Bethany Winslow, who is our uh, Director of Online Learning for iSchool. And she has a fascinating um, background and, and areas that she's going to share with us now. So thanks, take it away, Bethany. Great, thank you so much for that introduction. Hello everyone, uh, I am the Director of Online Learning here and I am so excited to speak to you guys today because I really do love the field of instructional design and it's a great career in the information intermediation and instruction path. And being an instructional designer is still the foundation of my work here and it's part of my professional identity. Uh, before I came to the School of Information, I worked as an instructional designer at eCampus that's the department that serves all of San Jose State University with uh, managing the learning management system and uh, working with different faculty uh, across campus to design or redesign their courses and integrate uh, technologies with their teaching. And before that, I worked as an instructional designer for a private company that helped schools across the country to launch their online programs. Um, and that served a, a range of students, working with students from vocational schools uh, to undergraduates up to graduate level programs at uh, four-year institutions like San Jose State. And in the course of my work, I've really seen uh, there is a, a, a really big overlap with uh, LIS professionals and instructional designers, because very broadly speaking, we're both working to achieve the very same ends, and that is to make usable information accessible to everyone. And in today's world, with such large volumes of information that's subject to change very quickly, the uh, skills to be able to analyze, organize, and present that information in different ways to different end users is, I think, a really critical uh, skill. 
So I think this is a very compelling career path and there's multiple ways in which you could end up there. I can't possibly cover all of that. I've met instructional designers who come from all sorts of backgrounds, from teaching, technical writing, web design, sales and marketing. And there's all sorts of undergraduate or graduate degree programs too that lead to this path. It's it's not, there's not just one road. The skill set is so broad and it's evolving constantly. But what every instructional designer that I know, what we share in common, I think, is first of all, a love of learning. And secondly, uh, I think we're really geeks about categories, uh, categorizing and organizing things, organizing information. And one of the things I really most love about the career is that it demands that you have a wide range in terms of being able to be very good at big picture thinking all the way down to being highly detail oriented. So um, in my current position at the iSchool, I'm uh, the course coordinator for a couple of classes that I um, help teach, but these aren't traditional academic courses that you guys would take, but they are the kinds of courses that you might develop or teach if you end up on this kind of career pathway and you work in the academic world as an instructional designer. One of the courses I, um, I manage is teaching online. That's the course that new iSchool faculty take. And among other topics, it covers how to design a course based on learning outcomes and developing content. I also briefly covered um, a backwards by design model. Um, but I'm also the uh, coordinator now for Info 203, which um, probably you remember taking. Um, I do teach a course and manage the peer mentors that are preparing to be the teaching assistants for that course. So they get kind of a, a crash course in learning theory because uh, those students do design and lead uh, a meetup. They create a short uh, instructional tutorial video for a couple of their assignments. And in my work, I've also um, designed self-paced online courses. I've created a lot of different workshops for both in-person and remote delivery. I've made a lot of training videos. I've certainly written a lot of tutorials and cheat sheets on various topics and technologies. And, you know, when I skimmed the recent MLAS skills at work snapshot, and I think um, Sheila probably has that on this um, presentation, there were a couple things that really stood out for me that I wanted to impress upon you. And first of all, uh, there's some excellent advice there on page 40. It says specifically, and I'll quote, do not underestimate the value of non-LIS experience. I can't emphasize that enough because it, and, and the, that goes on to recommend that, you know, you should inventory your skills and really cultivate being adaptable. That's, that's great advice because in my own life, in my career, I've actually had multiple careers that seem to be wildly divergent, but I know from experience and from observation of my peers working alongside other instructional designers, I know that what has set me apart and has made me more effective is some skills from, for example, uh, you know, I have a sales and marketing background, among other things. And I've observed literally working alongside other colleagues that don't have that same skill or background. I've observed a tendency in them to be generally a bit more deferential to subject matter experts and not really um, as confident in, in advocating for good design. And I, I really credit my sales background with that point of effectiveness. So um, when I, I think about looking at the foundational and recommended courses that um, Sheila and Taryn were showing earlier in this presentation, there are so many that jump out uh, at me that I would love to take, but just a few of them. Info 287, Seminar on Information Science. The sections, there's three of them, Gamifying Information, Design Thinking, User Experience. Oh, that's those are three huge, awesome topics. Uh, Info 246, the section on information visualization. That would be great. Info 251, web usability. And of course, I did notice there's an Info 283, marketing of information products and services. So, so many different ways to kind of um, forge a pathway into this, um, into this field and forge a new pathway that maybe doesn't even exist yet. But uh, the people who teach those courses, they would be great to speak to about the curriculum. I don't teach any of those courses, so um, definitely check our website for more information. But I have three big final takeaways, if, if at all you're interested in this career path, uh, specifically instructional design. And my three takeaways are this. First of all, I'd say you need to focus on the pedagogy, not the technology. Technology changes constantly. 
the principles of instructional design and learning theory, they evolve over time, but they're more stable. And, I, and what I mean to say here too, is that knowing how to use a technology tool is not the same thing as being able to effectively design a lesson that uses it or to teach effectively with that tool. That is a huge misconception. So the technology is not the center of it all. It's, it's, it's the pedagogy or the andragogy. Um, secondly, I would say seek out opportunities to create things for your portfolio. You might not think that a one-page cheat sheet is a big deal, but I tell you there is a well-written and concise guide is gold. So create before and after examples. If you see something in your own workplace that's a bit muddled, I say go fix it and get permission to post the before and after on your website or your portfolio. Um, and the final point is I'd say you've got to love the partnership and the process. A lot of instructional design work is actually reworking existing content. You're not necessarily starting from scratch. Um, you've got to love working as a partner with other people, specifically subject matter experts that you'll work with to help bring uh, a vision to life. So if you like being an editor, a guide on the side, kind of helping to refine and improve things, I think you'd really enjoy this kind of work. Um, I think of it as, um, you know, sort of order and chaos. The difference in, uh, if, for instructional design, if I had to leave you with an image in your mind, I'd say there's, a, um, there's an old bookstore with books piled up higgly piggly all over the place. And then there's the library where it's organized, you know, and if you, if you like the organizational side of things, I think you have the heart of an instructional designer. So I welcome any questions. I think that's about it for me. Oh, that was awesome. Thank you for walking us through both your career trajectory and how it was not a straight line. Um, and then also all of your wonderful tips on, um, you know, the, the, hot sizzling classes that you would just not be able to pass up on if you were a student following this pathway. Those are great, um, great suggestions from all of our panelists. We have the floor open now. Um, everyone should be able to enter their questions for our three panelists into the chat. I want to remind everyone to please select panelists and attendees from the chat menu um, at the top of the the chat interface um, so that everyone can see your question. And I have a little commercial on this slide to let everybody know that Taryn and I are available for live chat services um, during the day. And we also are available for um, student services, personalized advising appointments. If you wanna sign up to meet with us in Zoom, we're doing those on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And if you have feedback on the workshop, you can also um, send us an email. So looking for questions in the chat window while we're waiting for those to come in. I did have a question come in before the session and I'll go ahead and read the question and see if any of our panelists would like to um, have a stab at answering it. Um, a lot of these themes have already been um, touched on, but the question is, how would a school librarian make the transition into this pathway? or any of the pathways to be fair, when our work experience has been in education? Is it challenging even with the MLIS? So maybe some tips for MLIS students who are classroom teachers or school librarians specifically that want to work in a different LIS environment, how they would position themselves, what are the, some of the things they could be doing to position themselves to be competitive, uh, to, to change to a different environment. I was thinking myself, um, uh, Info 203 peer mentoring um, opportunity might be such a good experience. Do any of our other panelists have other suggestions? Well, I'll just chime in here. This is Bethany, just because you mentioned the uh, Info 203, the peer mentors. Um, but if somebody was working as an academic librarian and maybe wanted to shift gears, um, it, like I said with my, my, one of my last points, um, I would say look for the opportunities and they're there. You don't even have to look for them. If you are working in a library today, I see this. I, I talk to people who are librarians and I see what they're doing. And I'm thinking, wow, do you realize you're doing instructional 
design. You're being asked to create tutorials, create um, uh, examples for people on how, whether it's how to use the library or it's some exhibit that you're creating. Um, so those are, are you, you're, you are engaged in instructional design, for example. So documenting those experiences and being able to essentially, it's, it's kind of, um, it, it, it's spinning it, you know, you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're just, you're just being able to describe what you're doing to somebody else. That's the key skill. We've talked a lot in this presentation about some of the soft skills and the people skills. Well, I think this is also being able to present yourself in terms of, you know, using LinkedIn learning. And I would absolutely recommend you guys use LinkedIn, look at profiles, um, but being able to take what it is you do for your work, whether it's academic work or what work in your workplace and being able to say, oh, this actually matches over to there, being able to market yourself effectively and say, I've been doing instructional design work, even though I've worked as a librarian and here's how. Um, so being able to put yourself out there into a different, uh, looking for positions that you wouldn't otherwise consider, you know, broadening your horizons. Um, so I, I think there's ways to do that, but I think it's, it's, um, it's kind of a matter of, um, it, it's soft skills, but it's also self-promotion skills in a way. That's all I'll say to that. Yeah, we actually have a class um, that's all about marketing yourself in the LIS um, landscape and marketing up your repackaging what you know how to do and 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 preparing that for the job search and how you can, like Bethany mentioned, you can um, <clears throat> repackage up what you know how to do for a different environment. Any other panelists have other suggestions or ideas? We have so many opportunities for involvement here, um, getting involved in our student organizations as a leader, um, perhaps giving a training, um, an online training that you can leverage in explaining in a job interview, in a jobs uh, story or vignette of how you, you leverage those skills that you learned to a different type of environment that you've worked in. We have a few Oh, it's Bethany's comments in the chat. I was looking to see if we had any other questions for our panelists. All right, here we go. Wondering how would the digital assets management certificate overlap with the information intermediation and instruction pathway? Do any of our panelists uh, would like to comment on this one? I'll say that the digital assets certificate is only nine units of your 27 units of electives. And um, those courses are very um, technology skill focused, um, learning how to use digital assets um, to organize, uh, digital assets management skills to organize digital assets. Um, there's also one on information security and governance is one of the other pathways. So um, instructional design and information instruction um, is it's quite different than um, the aim of the of, of the digital assets certificate. If not sure if any of the other panelists want to to mention anything in addition. This is Jose. Um, I believe it's Tina who's asking that question. Um, just it came to to my mind right now as I'm listening to, to Sheila's giving her explanation. The skills that you develop in Info 210 can come in handy, especially in today's world of digital information. With the Digital Assets Management Certificate, um, it was mentioned about security and uh, privacy, I would imagine. Um, that also would pertain to such as the um, pr providing to the overlap as you're asking about. Great. Um, we have another question that's come in. Um, the question is, what are some of the challenges and obstacles that professionals might encounter in the instructional design field? And what are your recommendations for overcoming or mitigating them? Well, I, I guess I'll speak to that. This is Bethany again. <laughs> I think one of the challenges um, would be and it's kind of a mindset thing. So it's, it's not a skill set thing because skills 
are things that you can, um, you can all, in fact, you should be a lifelong learner. You should always be um, learning new things and, and learning new skills. So not being attached to one technology, one field, one, one hard rigid pathway. Um, being willing to adapt to change is, is a challenge for some people, but it really comes down to the mindset. So I would say the mindset is, is probably one of the challenges and related to that would be confidence because um, not everybody's comfortable with change or with ambiguity, but the reality is, is that um, in the instructional design field, you're going to work with all different kinds of people. If you go work in the private sector, you're going to be suddenly working, you know, if I, I have a friend who's an instructional designer at Tesla, right? And she did academic, you know, instructional design, and then you go work at Tesla. And now you got to learn how to, you know, explain how these engine parts work or whatever, right? You've got to be willing to learn and grow and the confidence to know that you can make those changes. Th those are the biggest challenges uh, or obstacles. Uh, what are the recommendations for overcoming or mitigating them? I would say cultivating the mindset um, to really see yourself uh, as somebody who um, is a lifelong learner that embraces change, embraces ambiguity, and can kind of roll with those changes. That is a big part of, um, I think, the, 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 the mindset part of the job. So I hope that helps. It's probably not the answer you wanted, but that's what I got for you, Amber. I thought that was great, Bethany. Um, growth mindset is really huge. And then I'm also wondering, um, do you have specific recommendations for instructional um, professional organizations or websites or places where you continu continuously grow your knowledge in the field that um, helps you to mitigate um, the explosion of of uh, things that you have to keep up with to stay up in the field? Or do you have some suggestions for people in that area? Well, I, I definitely think uh, leverage, um, leverage community because one of the things, one of my um, librarian colleagues that I work with in virtual, virtual stuff that I do, she constantly talks about the, the need for us to um, leverage each other's expertise. We can't possibly know everything. The, 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 the volume of information and change that we're facing, uh, you know, as a society or whatever in any industry is, is exponential. So um, working with other colleagues um, to help kind of leverage different skill sets, I think is critical. I mean, I, I have, you know, different, um, I subscribe to so many different um, subscriptions and other people who consolidate different uh, areas of information, um, working with other instructional designers. If I have a question about an instructional technology, oh my God, I, I can't even begin to tell you how many, how many platforms there are just for, for example, social virtual worlds. I can't, I, I literally can't catalog them all. I can't keep track of all of them. I have to work with other people. I explore these. I learn and fool around with this technology over here. And then I compare notes with my colleagues. So cultivating a, um, a circle of um, colleagues, professional colleagues, communities of practice, professional associations, that's certainly um, a part of it. Um, there's great books. If anybody's interested in instructional design, you just want one good book that sort of explains it in a nutshell, Julie Dirksen's Design for How People Learn. It's one of the easiest, best, um, you know, very highly rated. It's a great book for a reason. It's super easy to read to get a big picture glimpse at what instructional design is as a, as a career. Um, design for How People Learn, Julie Dirksen. But there's a gazillion websites. Oh my gosh, I, I couldn't just say, oh, here's the one. There is no one. There's no one ring to rule them all. <laughs> That's wonderful. Maybe if you have a chance, you could type it into the chat so they have the author's um, spelling. I wonder if any of our panelists, um, did they want to mention anything else, other resources, uh, professional development resources, or any other tips? This is Jose again. I believe some tips would be especially as a, as a current MLIS student, get involved with the national organizations. Um, get involved with the local organizations through the, through the iSchool. Um, get involved and that will start opening up opportunities for you, for what you're thinking about, which career path you wanna follow on. Um, if I had not done that and I'm an introverted person, 
I would not have succeeded as much as I have so far. You have to push yourself. And you may hear this all the time. You know, you got to do it. You got to do it. You're the only one that can do it. But you also have faculty and colleagues here at the iSchool that are here to support you and even give you a boost to introduce you to other people. So um, just keep that in mind. And last but not least, any of you that are interested in open educational resources, the market is out there for individuals that are getting their MLIS that have OER experience, whether as a student, but as a also someone that has created OER. That is something that uh, you may wanna think about whichever path you're gonna pursue. Wonderful. And since we have a few minutes, why don't you maybe detail some of our students might be new to OER? What exactly is open educational? What are open educational resources? Sure. Thank you, Sheila. Um, OER, Open Educational Resources, the idea behind this concept is to provide textbooks, electronic test textbooks to students at zero cost. That's one of the definitions. Um, within the California Community College system, what they've done, and there are, they are way ahead of the game, they have, have started to create zero textbook cost degrees that your entire degree will have zero cost in um, purchasing textbooks. The, the textbook can be created by the faculty member and they create it, maybe it's a brand new one, or they can adapt an open educational resource with a licensing called Creative Commons, which is similar to copyright. And by adapting other textbooks that have been created, OERs, they can create one that will be a fruitful product for the student at that specific institution. Um, it's a wonderful way to help student success, but also to be aware of the financial struggles that happen when you're going through school. You have family responsibilities, you got work responsibilities. Sometimes you may not be able to afford the textbook. This is one pathway to uh, pursue that. Okay, that was an excellent explanation. And we do have the OER class here at iSchool. So if you wanna future proof your course selections, um, take those tips and make sure you're taking classes that are on the edge of all the trends in information, intermediation and instruction. We also have another tip that students in the pathway may also consider opportunities related to scholarly communication services at libraries. And there's a link um, from Dr. Lua. So if she would like to, if you would like to expound on that a little bit, we have a couple more minutes before closing the session today. Yeah, sure. Because uh, I was just thinking about how uh, academic libraries uh, in recent years have um, increased their investment in services that are supporting scholarly communications at their institutions. The link that I just sent out uh, was this uh, whole, uh, this graph uh, um, detailing the different stages of the research life cycle. And, uh, and that comes from the University of Central Florida Libraries. And they've identified the stages of the research life cycle where uh, academic, academic libraries can really play a role in supporting. And if you really look at the services and the kind of uh, scholarly communication support services libraries can provide, involve lots of skills that we are trying to impart in this path, uh, career pathway. Like you, you have to design training and workshops and for faculty to assist them in the, um, in the scholarly com communication process, helping them uh, understand um, the, all the uh, necessary elements related in the process to provide assistance. So that's something that uh, students in this career pathway may also consider in if, if they wish to explore more about this. Wonderful. Thank you for that. And I want to thank all of our panelists um, for your expertise in joining us for Q&A for this session. Um, there is a, oh, there's one final question about marketing yourself. Um, it is an info class. Um, it's taught by Scott Brown. And if you want to email me, Kathleen, I will send you the link to that class. Um, it is a, I believe it's a two unit class, if I'm not mistaken, but um, 
yeah, send me an email and I'll follow up with it with you. And I wanted to thank all of our panelists, Dr. Lua, Dr. Aguinaga, and Bethany Winslow for sharing your time with us on your lunchtime. And we hope to see um, students again for our next pathway workshop, um, which we'll be doing in the fall. So thank you again, everyone, for your time and your thoughtful questions. And if you have follow-up questions, um, please reach out to us at iSchool at sjsu.edu.